They don't want to go after the, the teacher. They want to go after the student. They don't want to go after someone who's been saved a long time and has studied the scriptures. They want to go after someone who is weak in the faith, who is new in the faith. That's what they're after. Wolves go after the lambs. Matthew chapter 7, we'll be reading one verse and having a word of prayer. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's read one verse and then you can be seated. Does that sound better? Matthew chapter 7, verse number 15. Would you read that out loud with me now together? Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You may be seated. Well, what an interesting verse here we have before us tonight. And the Lord Jesus here, he sounds out a warning about false teachers. You notice the verse again, beware of false prophets. And, of course, the prophets would proclaim forth. And so uh, there were the good ones, and then there were the not-so-good ones. And the Lord Jesus was sort of exposing false teachers, and he likened, he made a similar comparison here, he likened the false teachers to wolves, and he indicated that they try to gain access to God's flock by appearing to be sheep. Now, sheep have many natural enemies. Uh, I think the volume's a little bit too loud. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Just turn it down just a touch, would you please? Thank you. Um, can you think of some of the natural enemies that sheep have? Now, don't say wolves, okay? But what else? Lions? Bears? Foxes, I suppose. Yeah, it goes on. There's a long list there. Some of them have two wings as well. But um, they have a lot of enemies. And out of all these enemies, the Lord Jesus chose one to use the comparison. He chose wolves. Now, why didn't he uh, choose something uh, bigger and, you know, scarier, maybe like a bear? Why didn't he choose a bear? Well, that's an interesting thought. A couple of ideas here. Wolves, believe it or not, generally have a similar size to the full-grown male sheep. Full-grown male sheep can uh, actually grow five and six feet long. And a, a wolf can, you know, grow that big. Now, a bear would be bigger. So there's a similarity of size between a wolf and a full-grown male sheep. Number two, wolves are highly intelligent, whereas sheep, uh, they're not as clever as wolves. They're smart. They can do some certain things, but they're nowhere near as cunning and intelligent as wolves are. And the third reason, uh, wolves love the taste of sheep. Particularly, they go after the lambs, the little ones. I've read where um, if they go after bigger ones, they can have a harder time. Sometimes the it's been known sheep to gang up against a a predator, such as a wolf. But the wolves, they, uh, they go after the lambs rather than the full-grown sheep. Now, wolves are scary things. Let's face it. Wolves are scary things. Near to where I live, there's a man who owns two large wolf dogs. Now, how many have heard of wolf dogs? Raise your hand if you've heard of wolf dogs. Okay. Well, can you guess what they are? Hmm. Uh. And 90% wolf. They're a dog, but 90% wolf. And they are big. And they are scary things. And the first time I saw one of these two dogs, these wolf dogs, that he, he owns two of them. And a few years ago, when I first saw it, the first one, and I was sure I was looking at a wolf. And there was other people there. This is right in my neighborhood, on my street. And uh, people were on their phones calling the police. And I got in my car and I followed this thing so that I could see where it was to tell the police. It's in there, officer. And I followed it until it ran into the backyard of one of the houses near to where I live. And the police came and talked to the owner. And that's when we all found out what they were. And it's perfectly legal for him to own these things, but he has to you know, keep them under lock and key, mind you. But uh, they're big and they're scary, and those things are only wolf dogs. Now, uh, if a mouse were to get loose in the church here 
and someone looked down and they saw a mouse, it would, it would naturally make some people afraid, wouldn't it? Some, I'm sure, would say, hey, let's try and catch it. Others would jump up on a, a pew or maybe someone would jump on a table or you know, jump into someone's arms. It would naturally cause people to feel some you know, fear if a mouse got loose in the church. But what if a full-grown wolf got loose in the church? Well, now we're not talking so much fear. We're talking terror. We're talking pandemonium. We're talking screaming, yelling, and let me out of here if there was a full-grown wolf on the loose here in the building. Now, that's never happened. We have had a mouse run around once, but we caught it. But uh, we never had a wolf come. Praise the Lord. But tonight, we're going to learn some things about wolves that might help us to recognize. How do you recognize a wolf in sheep's clothing? Yeah, the idea is that they dress up, they appear to be like a sheep. So how do you know that it's a wolf and not a sheep? And maybe more important, we'll learn a few things, what we can do to protect ourselves from wolves. So that's what we'll try and do tonight. So now let's bow our heads and close our eyes and pray. Our Heavenly Father, please help us tonight and give us wisdom. Holy Spirit of God, you are the greatest teacher in this whole world. And we do ask that you would teach us your truth and take us by the hand and lead us into truth. And the truth shall make us free. And we pray, Father, once again, that you would increase our faith and our love for you, our commitment, our desire to live for Jesus daily, to serve, to give, to pray, to be everything you want us to be. We pray your rich blessing on those that are watching online. Please help the internet to go well. There would be no problem with that. Keep your hedge of protection around us, dear Father. Yeah, even this subject of wolves in sheep's clothing. Protect our little flock here. Protect us from our ultimate enemy, Satan. And now, Father, open the eyes of our understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, remember, Jesus was talking wolves. He wasn't talking about goats that think they're sheep. Last week, remember we talked about imitation sheep? You remember that? And by and large, these folks tend to be harmless. They tend to think they're saved, but they're not saved. They try to act like sheep, behave like sheep, but deep down they're not really saved. We talked about that. You can go back online and watch that message if you like. But we're talking here, the Lord Jesus, I should say, is talking about wolves dressed up like sheep. And he used that analogy to expose false teachers. And false teachers are like wolves in sheep's clothing. So what are some of the similarities between wolves and false teachers? Well, number one is wolves are naturally bloodthirsty meat eaters. And so are false teachers in a manner of speaking. Now, wolves... <clears throat> they don't feel bad when they kill an animal. They've got no guilty conscience. They have a taste, a thirst for the blood and the meat. It's in their nature. Wolves are naturally ferocious and very brutal animals. If you've done any reading on them, like a wolf pack, for example, uh, they're <laughs> very, very brutal animals when taking down a um, a prey. And likewise, false teachers, they have no sense of guilt when they tell you lies. The, uh, the wolf doesn't feel bad to kill the sheep, and false teachers don't feel bad. They have no sense of guilt for leading people astray. It's what they do. Now take your Bible, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And here we see in verse number 15, the Lord Jesus is exposing the wolves in sheep's clothing. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So there you go. These Hypocrites, scribes, Pharisees, Jesus pronounced woe upon them. Uh, they were false teachers. 
They were wolves in sheep's clothing. They were doing what comes natural to them, and they had no guilty conscience over it. And false teachers are like that. Uh, many false teachers will tell you right to your face that they love Jesus, and Jesus is their Lord. But they don't really mean it. They're just words. They're telling you what, you think you, what they think you want to hear. They're trying to be salesmen. Now, now I'm not down on salesmen. Hooray, you know, for the salesmen and saleswomen. Salespeople, I guess we call them these days, right? You know, we, we do need them. But uh, some of them are crooks. You know that. Some are crooks. Not all of them, but some of them are. And it'd be like that with teachers. Hooray for the teachers. And a lot of them are good, but some of them are crooks. Some of them are false teachers. And that's what the Lord Jesus is pointing out. And these false teachers will tell you Jesus is their Lord, but they don't mean it. And they have no conscience. Conscience doesn't bother them whatsoever. They tell you lies. They can sleep peacefully at night. They will lure you with their bait, and then they will catch you with their net. That's what they're trying to do. Now, an illustration of this kind of thing happens all the time when young girls get tricked into marriage by some cruel, mean-hearted man. There's a, a cute story about a, a little bird, a dove, and she was a sweet little bird, a sweet little thing, and she fell in love with a very charming buzzard. Now, a buzzard is like a vulture. It's one of those two-winged you know, beasts that land upon dead things and gorge all of the meat and the blood. And they kind of, uh, you know, they're like the sharks of the desert, sort of, you know, and they go after things that are dead. And so she fell in love with a buzzard. And all her friends and all her family tried to warn her and tell her, don't marry this guy, he's a buzzard. And she would simply reply, oh, but he's so sweet and he loves me. And he told me that he doesn't do those things anymore. He's changed. He's a changed buzzard. He's a new buzzard. And so whatever they said, they couldn't seem to convince, convince her. And so they got married. And soon after the wedding, she noticed that he started staying out later and later each night. And she began to get worried. And so one night she decided she'd follow him her buzzard husband. And she found him with his buzzard buddies all huddled around a dead stinking carcass and their beaks and their heads were all drenched in blood and they were laughing as they were gorging on the, the decaying flesh. And she saw this and her husband right in the middle of it all and it broke her heart. And she, she cried and she wept and, and he looked up and saw her and she looked at him and said, how could you possibly do this? And he answered her and said, What are you crying about? You knew I was a buzzard before you married me. Sadly, 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 that plays true in real life. And a lot of young girls got in their heart broken by marrying some buzzard who said, Oh, I love you, sweetheart. Anyhow, it sort of illustrates these false teachers. We're talking about the similarity between wolves and false teachers. And the first similarity I want to point out is that wolves are bloodthirsty by nature. And in a manner of speaking, so are the false teachers. All you got to do is look at the scribes and Pharisees and the hypocrites of Jesus' day to, to see what we're talking about. All right, that's the first similarity. The second similarity is wolves are intelligent and clever and so are the false teachers. They are intelligent and clever. You know, there is coming very soon, I'm sure, to this world, a leader that the Bible calls the Antichrist. And when you get to know what the Antichrist is going to be like by reading Scripture, you'll get to find out that he's going to be a very powerful, influential, charismatic, I don't mean like the Pentecostal charismatic of today, I mean like very charming and he'll have a magnetic personality and he'll just attract people to himself. And the Bible says that he's going to be given a mouth to speak great swelling things. 
And a lot of these things he's going to be speaking are going to be directly against God. But the Antichrist is going to be a highly intelligent, real gifted speaker. And people are just going to be attracted to him. You know, Hitler was the same way. And the, the nation of Germany was fooled. Now, they didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. He was corrupt from the get-go. But that's not how he was portrayed in the, uh, the, the pictures and on, on the, the TV uh, um, uh, broadcast and so on. He was portrayed as the savior of Germany. And they showed him holding hands with children and smiling and how all the girls were all excited over, over him to get their picture taken with Adolf Hitler and how he was putting the industry back on its feet. All the while, he was arming Germany for war. And it was in his mind to conquer and to destroy the Jewish people. And so here, Hitler was like a, a prefigure, if you will, of the coming Antichrist. Because Antichrist is going to be very similar to that. Very um, charming. And uh, the ability to speak these incredible speeches. And false teachers are just like that. They're very, they tend to be very charming. False teachers uh, tend to be very um, uh, uh, like magnetic in their personality. To draw people to themselves. They, they tend to be um, uh, very intelligent people. Many false teachers have a, a sharp mind for debate. They can debate. And you talk to them and ask them something and they got an answer for you. And it seems whatever you throw at them, they got an answer. It seems like they've thought it all through or something. I used to know some kids like that when I was in high school. Uh, just whatever was thrown at them, bang, you know. They had just the comeback. And uh, would sort of fool people. Now, the Apostle Paul for example, was not a fancy orator. He was not one of these gifted, golden-tongued orators. He wasn't. And his enemies often criticized his speech. They hated Paul. The false teachers hated Paul, the Apostle Paul, and they tried to put him down. They tried to discredit him in the eyes of the church people. And they would criticize him, the way he looked and his speech. And what Paul did was he quoted these people, in 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. Here's what he said. His bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That's what the critics, the enemies, the false teachers were saying of the Apostle Paul. Of course, the false teachers, they all had the gift of the gab and they all had the ability of debate and real comebacks and things like that. But Paul wasn't like that. You know, I'll be honest with you, Benny Hinn is ever so charming. Benny Hinn is a very gifted speaker. He's a highly intelligent man. When the news media manages to get an interview with him and they question him about his phony healings, because you know this, you've heard, you, I'm sure you've heard of this, people that have claimed to have been healed and then found out they weren't really healed or the healing wore off or something like that. Or all of the, the people that get turned away from the healing lines because they have real honest diseases and what he wants is to be able to heal people of a pimple, you know, or a stomach ache or something like that. Things that you can't see, things that are hard to check out. And so when the news media confronts him about his phony healings or if the news media confronts him about his outrageous, lavish lifestyle, he always has these answers. He can come back with these answers that seem to shut them down. He's very, he's very polished. He's very gifted. But false teachers are like that. They're very good at what they do. Wolves are very clever when it comes to hunting down an animal. Do some reading on wolf packs. And it's amazing. The wolves, they won't just attack anything. They'll pick their prey. They're opportunists. They're looking for opportunity. And they're looking for a weakness. And they operate together like a team. You've seen the football teams and how each man knows what to do. Where to be, where to go, when to turn, how to block, what to look for. 
They work like a team. A basketball team is like that too. A well-oiled machine. And that's how wolf packs are. They're incredibly advanced. Very clever. And when they lock on to a prey, they don't give up. I mean, they, it's like the whistle is blown and they throw caution to the wind. They, they know what they're doing and they go after this prey. And they love it, the, 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 the chase and the hunt. And so wolves are very, very clever. Uh, Jesus spoke here in Matthew 7 about wolves, plural. Uh, wolves don't usually hunt all alone. They often hunt in groups. And so when Jesus spoke of wolves, plural, it almost gives you the impression that where there's one, there's more. So they could be there with buddies, with others. So that's a possibility. But what we're saying, number two, is that wolves are intelligent and clever, and so are false teachers. All right, number three. Wolves go after the lambs. That's what they do. They go after the lambs and the false teachers. They go after new Christians and weak or immature Christians. That's who the false teachers go after. Hey, I've been in the ministry over 40 years now, and I have faced down some of these false teachers. I've had to go after them. They never seem to come after me. They don't want to go after the, the teacher. They want to go after the student. They don't want to go after someone who's been saved a long time and has studied the scriptures. They want to go after someone who is weak in the faith, who's new in the faith. That's what they're after. Wolves go after the lambs. It's easy prey. And false teachers go after the new Christian, the newbie Christian, or the Christian who just isn't growing. He or she is stunted in their growth because they're not growing the way they should. And they become easy to pray, easy targets for these wolves. Now, um, John Calvin was a controversial figure in the early Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. He published a series of doctrines that became known as Calvinism. And I want you to know that I've studied Calvinism and the scriptures they use. I've talked to Calvinists. I've read Calvinist material. I have studied this for decades. I am not a Calvinist, okay? I am not. Um, but people who do follow John Calvin's doctrines often, not always, but often do not get involved with evangelism. Calvin was not an evangelist. He was not. And his theology works against evangelism and soul winning. And so people who follow Calvin's doctrines, not all of them by any stretch, but a lot of them want basically nothing to do with evangelism or soul winning or missions. And you say, why is that? It's their own theology, folks. They've been taught that if God wants to save a soul, He's going to do it regardless of what you do. Some Calvinists go as far as to say that if you get involved with trying to witness to someone, you are going to frustrate the plans of an almighty sovereign God. Which when you think of it is a contradiction of terms because if he's that sovereign and almighty, how can you possibly, anything you do, frustrate his plan? They don't have an explanation for that. But the bottom line is, uh, a lot of them want nothing to do with soul winning, evangelism, and missions. Now, I'm not saying all of them by any stretch. Charles Spurgeon, from time to time, he would uh, uh, refer to himself with some Calvinist doctrine, but he wasn't a hyper-Calvinist. He wasn't a hardcore. He believed in soul winning. He had kind of a, a balance going there. And there's many other like him. But the five main points of Calvinism, I have a problem with. I don't have a problem with God being sovereign. But listen, I'll tell you something. When a man has to play both sides of the chessboard, there's something wrong. I believe that God is sovereign and he's so wise, he knows what's in men's hearts and he knows what they will choose. God doesn't have to play both sides of the chessboard. God knows what it is that you and I are going to end up doing from our own free will. Men who are lost end up in hell by their own choice. They reject Jesus Christ. 
No one, no one will ever be able to stand before Jesus Christ on that great day at the great white throne and point a finger and say, well, hey, 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 what about me? You didn't elect me. If you had elected me, I would have received you. I don't deserve to be damned into hell forever and ever. No, it's not going to work that way. The, the Calvinist doctrine teaches that God, for who knows whatever reason, sovereignly picks who he wants, and then he ordains the rest to hell. Ah, listen, I don't buy that. And so this is why Calvinists, those who are consider themselves strong Calvinists, want nothing much to do with soul winning evangelism or missions. Now, to prove my point, all you need do, and anyone can do this, just go on the internet and find a Calvinist church. You say, well, how do I know if it's a Calvinist church? Because they'll tell you. They always tell you. We believe in the doctrines of grace. That's what they call it now. They don't like calling it Calvinism because they don't like the label Calvinist. They call it doctrines of grace. We believe in the doctrines of grace. Okay, all right, well, you might have a, a Calvinist church there. Now go check out their activities. You found them online? Okay, check out. What are they doing for missions? What are they doing for evangelism and soul winning? Now, again, I'm not tarring everyone with the same brush because there are Calvinists that are involved with soul winning, and, and that's great. Praise the Lord. God will straighten out their doctrine in heaven. But those churches that have closed the door on trying to win the lost to Christ have disqualified themselves from even being a church because the Lord Jesus gave the church the marching orders to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is as plain as she gets, folks, given to us five times, four Gospels, and also in the book of Acts, it's given to us. And you look at the book of Acts, what did they do? Well, they went into all the world and they preached the Gospel. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a hyper-Calvinist, you know, and stand before the Lord one day. So, uh, John Calvin, he, God has dealt with him, whatever, long time ago. But my point is this, um, the facts speak for themselves. And we're looking at a wolf in sheep's clothing. Back in uh, the uh, 1981, my, not 80 and 81, my last year in Bible college, uh, I was attending a church in London, Ontario, and I heard about a young man named Willie Oosterman. And uh, Mr. Oosterman was trying to build a church there in the city of London, Ontario. But he was a hyper-Calvinist. And because of that, his own theology prevented him from knocking on doors and witnessing and giving gospel tracts and trying to win people to Christ. And so what Mr. Oosterman would do is he would go into Bible-believing churches and he would look for young and new believers. And then he would try and engage them in theology and indoctrinate them and try and get them to leave that church and follow him. This was his method of building a church. We have another term for that. It's called sheep thief. Sheep stealing. You know, these guys are going to answer to God for their actions and for what they, they have done and are doing. And, and it's still going on. Wolves are able to sense weakness in a prey. And so are false teachers. False teachers, they, they get up close to you and they can look in your eye and they can ask you questions, and they can listen to your answer, and the sound in your voice, and the way you turn your head, and so on. And they can sense if there's weakness there or not. And they'll find the weaker believers, and the, the baby Christians. And these are the ones they go after. Just like the wolves go after the lambs, the false teachers will go after the uh, infant Christians, the vulnerable ones. And so wolves can sense weakness and vulnerability in their prey. They go after the lambs. And false teachers go after the new Christians and the weaker Christians. All right. Time to start to bring this to a close. How do we protect ourselves against wolves? Because, you know, you never know when a wolf in sheep's clothing is going to walk into your church. So... What do you do? How do we protect ourselves? Well, we'll look at three or four verses of Scripture. Um, here I want to give you three points. Number one, 
The false teachers go after the weak Christians. So, like this is obvious. The answer then is make sure you're growing strong in the Bible and stay close to the Lord. Now let's take our Bible and turn to the book of 2 Peter near the end of the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to get your help to read out loud with me verse number 18, if you would please. The last verse of Second Peter chapter 3. Read it out loud with me now. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And so here we have good counsel. To grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, a few years ago, we had a young man attend our church and he seemed to be born again and he seemed to be on board with us, with our doctrine and our programs. And um, he made friends with a couple of um, weaker Christians. Uh, and so uh, one day... I exposed a harmful false teacher on the internet and he blew a gasket. Apparently, he loved this false teacher. And so he uh, quickly left our church and he influenced those two weaker Christians to leave as well. And that hurt when I saw that happen. You can't always tell... Um, if someone's a wolf in sheep's clothing, you can't always tell. Hopefully, you know, you keep praying and looking and asking good questions and keep your eyes open and the Lord will show you. But sometimes you don't know. Now that's, that's not particularly um, a real fault uh, because if you think about it, out of Jesus' 12 disciples, uh, Jesus knew who Judas was. Jesus knew that Judas was a wolf in sheep's clothing. But the other 11 disciples who lived, ate, slept, drank, worked right alongside of Judas, they never, they never questioned Judas. They thought that he was a very trustworthy guy. They, let, they made him the, uh, the, the uh, church uh, accountant, the financial. <laughs> he held the bag of money. They trusted him that much. Maybe they took a vote. Well, we need to have a, someone look after the money here. Who's going to do that? I, vote, I nominate you know, Judas Iscariot. I second the motion. The finest man I know. All in favor? <laughs> now, maybe they didn't do that, but they all seemed to trust Judas. And he turned out to be a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. So you, only the Lord knows. So anyhow... Uh, that was a, a real pain in my heart when that, when that young man took off and, and took two more good young fellows with him. And so the point here is make sure you're growing strong every day. Make sure you're growing stronger. You're stronger today than you were yesterday through careful Bible study and through earnest prayer. You have to have a prayer closet. If you have a hit and miss time with the Lord, you are not as strong as you could be. And you might be a target for a crafty false teacher. Don't say it'll never happen to me. Point number two. If you sense a wolf in our church, then you need to come and tell the pastor about it. We're talking health and welfare, folks. We're talking personal safety. If you sense that there's a wolf in sheep's clothing in our church, then you need to come and let the pastor know. Now, for this, let's go back to Matthew 7. Back to where we began. Matthew 7. And, of course, we read verse 15, right? About beware, the Lord's words here. Beware of false prophets. So, false teachers. Now, look at the next couple of verses because the Lord is still dealing with this subject of wolves in sheep's clothing. He said in verse 16, concerning these wolves, these false teachers, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And the, of course the answer is no. 
Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So he's telling us to watch the fruit. Check the fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And so this person with the question mark over them, the person you're thinking, well, I wonder if this is a a wolf. You need to check out the fruit. Particularly the fruit of the Spirit. You need to check out if this person's life exhibits love, joy, and peace. You know, Galatians chapter 5 gives us the, the nine fruit of the Spirit there. Or do they seem to be always... You know, a bee under their bonnet about something. Are they always persnickety, you know, over some program or what the pastor said, you know, on Sunday morning or something? Are they trying to divide? Are they trying to steer people away from the church? That would be a good way, I think, to know. If they're trying to divide people away from the church, you need to let the pastor know. In Acts chapter 23, Paul was in prison. And Paul's nephew overheard a plot to kill Paul. There was a plan, an elaborate plan. And so the nephew went to speak to the chief captain and voiced his concerns. The chief captain was able to save Paul's life because the nephew went and shared his concern with the guy in charge. So in a nutshell, if you sense that there is a wolf in the church, then you need to come and let the pastor know. Number three, and this is probably the most important one maybe, is become, become a prayer warrior yourself. Learn how to become strong in prayer and pray for the church. And for this, I'd like you to, to look at Luke. Luke chapter 22. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse number um, 31 and 32. How about you read that out loud with me? It's only two verses. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, 32. Please read with me now. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Well, here is Satan trying to get a hold of Peter. And the answer was prayer. That's what Jesus was saying. The devil has put in special permission to get you He wants to sift you. He wants to shake you. But I've prayed for you. So that's the answer. We need to be strong in prayer. Because we can't fight an unseen enemy. Satan is too strong for us. Prayer brings the power of God into the church. Prayer puts a hedge of protection around us. Prayer will open the eyes of our understanding. Prayer will draw us in close with our Heavenly Father. Prayer can sweep a a wolf right off its feet and right out the door. So this one is very important. Prayer brings God's power. And we really can't afford to go a day without God's power. I hope with all my heart that every single one of us is daily, specifically asking God for a hedge of protection around our home and family and loved ones and around our church. Well, Remember that wolves are cunning just like the devil, tricky and cunning just like Satan himself, and and false teachers are the same way. But false teachers really are not the only wolves in sheep's clothing to try to attack the church. I'll tell you something. It's my opinion, rock music in the church has long been a wolf in sheep's clothing. The Hillsong Church Movement has been in the news lately. And it's not very good. 
a lot of their uh, uh, habits and practices have been brought to light. And there's some horrible, horrible things that have been going on. And the whole Hillsong church movement is worldwide. And I think it's more of a wolf in sheep's clothing than anything. It's getting exposed. But something else, you know, there's a movement afoot to try and put God's people back under Mosaic law. And sometimes wolves will come in and try and tell you that you need to be obeying the laws of Moses if you really want to be right with God. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You watch that. We've actually lost people because of that. There are those that come into churches and say, okay, well now you're saved, but now you really need to have all of the blessings. You need to have all of the miracles in your life. And they take you and run, run off to Benny Hinn meetings with you. Or they'll go to some of these deliverance meetings where they uh, say, okay, demons, demons, you've got demons in you. Listen, I believe in demons, I do. And I do believe that the Bible is right. You know, when it talks about demons, but a lot of the stuff happening today in the deliverance ministry, and I've checked that out too for many years, it's a sideshow. So that's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, one last verse of Scripture and we're done, okay? And I just want you to see this. Uh, Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter 20. This ought to, this would be a good place to stop. Acts chapter 20. This verse here. These are the words of the Apostle Paul himself. Very important words. And he got together the pastors from the church of Ephesus. And uh, they had a little pastors meeting on the seashore. And he was telling them some important things and had prayer with them. But in Acts chapter 20, verse 29, I want you to see what he said. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Now he's talking about the church at Ephesus. Grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Wow. Hey, if it could happen in the first century with the apostles still alive on earth, don't you think it could happen in the 21st century as the world is going crazy? And the church is becoming something we don't recognize anymore. Don't you think? Let's be beware. Like Jesus said. Let's beware. All right, let's pray. Thank you, dear, wonderful, heavenly Father. You're so good to us. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is the teacher of truth. Help us to daily be studying our Bible, praying earnestly, seeking to be filled daily with the Holy Spirit, to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Lead us in truth. Lead us in decisions. Please strengthen us in these last days. Now we thank you so very much for our time together tonight in studying the Scriptures. Help us to, to uh, maybe be, be aware of wolves. They're, they're still live and well here in Canada, right here in Surrey, B.C. Help us to be on guard and to be prayer warriors. And bless, we pray, this little flock in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.